Hello, and firstly my apologies to those expecting a continuation of the MMO series. As I made a little update video a few weeks ago, I've been very busy with work, and that situation hasn't really changed. In fact, I've not been at home very much at all over the last six weeks or so in order to make programming videos, but I promise you we'll resume that series first thing in the new year where we'll actually implement the game side of it. But that's enough about me, because this video is about you guys. It is the One Lone Coder Community Showcase 20. 2020, and wow have you guys been busy. Let's face it, this year has sucked. It's been a terrible year all around the world, and we all want it to end as quickly as possible and just simply go away and everything get back to normal. But it has meant that we have had additional programming time, lots of time sat at home in front of our computers to code lots of interesting things. And this year alone, we've actually had two jams. We had a beat the boredom jam at the start of the pandemic, and halfway through the pandemic, we had the official yearly One Lone Coder Code Jam 2020. And I'm going to start there with some of the entries I think needed a little bit more attention than they got. I'll start the showcase with a quick look at the Code Jam 2020 that we had this summer. And there were many, many great entries, far too many entries for me to go through in this video. So I'm picking the ones that particularly picked my interest. It's well worth going over to the itch.io website and checking out the jam. This was the winner, PyOMM. It's a game we had to program a thing to do things. And I also really recommend you check out Powerful Machine 2. I really liked the art style in this. You can see the results on the itch page. But here are some that I wanted to include in this year's community showcase. The first by Pseudo Davi is a little, well, Metroidvania style platform game where your cute little craft gets abilities and has to explore the map and use those abilities to get further. It's actually quite challenging. And as you can see, I wasn't very good at it. The Great Machine by Tarius Python is a logic simulator puzzle game. It presents you with an unknown logic circuit at the top of the screen, and you get to see what the behaviour of that circuit is, and then you've got to try and replicate it using standard off-the-shelf logic gates. It's built in the Pixel Game Engine, which obviously is a plus in my mind. There's quite a few different puzzles to choose from, and they get very challenging if you're not familiar with working with logic. Now this one became almost a meme on the community discord server by Alexio Escape the Machine. Everybody has played this game, and it's a very simple premise. You explore maps, you find keys, you unlock locks, and you progress forwards. But it's as hard as nails. You have to be really precise with your movement. There's lots of maps to play too. So good on you Alexio, this was a really good contribution. Now, this was also a lot of fun on the Discord server. This was Music Factory by Y. And the idea is you place the icons on this grid, and the balls follow these paths and hit different musical instruments, and you've got to try and compose interesting songs. I don't think anybody successfully wrote anything beautiful, but it was a lot of fun trying. Ben on the Discord server is, well, he's basically our moody teenager, and he created this entry for the showcase. And it started off, well, I thought it was glitching at first, but it's actually starting to tell a story. Oh dear, Ben. Now, what this turns into is an interesting exploration of lighting, and I believe procedural level generation. The actual game is fairly simple, you have to avoid being hit by these images of yourself, for as long as possible. I thought it was quite atmospheric. Your Toast by O'Curtains, well, this is just bonkers. 
Uh, you control a toaster and the idea is to shoot the other toasters with bread. I loved the retro aesthetic and sounds for this game. It's all very consistent and consistency really gives you that degree of polish. It was also quite fun to play too. Now this by Maybell I thought was perhaps one of the better entries of the jam, uh, particularly because it seems to be a completely custom engine. It renders this 3D pixelated look and I thought it was very well done because there's real time lighting and there's a day to night transition. The nature of the game is effectively a walking simulator stroke light puzzle game so I'm not going to give away the puzzles by playing through it here. Instead I'm going to randomly walk around the map pretending not to know what I'm doing. It doesn't take long to play through it, but it was quite satisfying when you get to the end. If not a little bewildering. Hmm, I really need a new video idea. I know, I'm going to make an MMO. Now the voice acting in this game is excellent. This was created by Gorbit99 and well it's effectively a cookie clicker revolving around a particular YouTuber. Ugh. This is going slowly. I know, I'm going to make an MMO making machine, there's no way that goes wrong. The objective of the exercise is to complete the tasks of this particular YouTuber's daily life, which typically involves moderating a Discord and replying to YouTube comments. You have to do this in order to make your bot more productive and you can buy perks and buffs at the bottom as you progress. Even though this looks very simple, and mostly it's nonsense, it's actually quite addictive to play. I wish I could show more, but I've got a lot to get through in this video. But you must go over to the itch.io page and download as many of them as you can. Lots of them are really fantastic to play, they're really highly polished, well engineered, well programmed, excellent demonstrations of people's ability, and it was just an on the whole a fantastic jam. Lots of people had a lot of fun, and we certainly had a lot of fun on the Discord server playing all of the games. People tend to live stream them in bulk, it was great fun watching, great fun taking part. So really well done to all of those people that took part. Next up, we have a bunch of showcase submissions from people that usually don't get very much attention on the server. Now, Russ Knight has been working hard on this character visualizer for the game Dwarf Fortress. I don't play Dwarf Fortress, so I don't know very much about it. But how this works is it hooks into the existing game, analyzing the memory. And then it recreates these portraits of the various dwarves, I presume, depending on their character traits within the game. I think it's quite polished. and the artwork certainly befitting of dwarves. Alban98 has gone on to create a NES emulator. We like NES emulators on the One Lone Coder channel. And this NES emulator I liked quite a bit because it shows you everything that's going on. Kind of like how mine did, but this seems to do it better. You can see the audio channels, you can see the name tables, you can see various graphics attributes that are happening, you can even see the code being executed. And the tools Alban provides allow you to step through the code and actually debug the NES games. Noobsy here has recreated the procedural universe I showed at the start of the year, but has added uh, some networking code to it too, to make it a multiplayer universe game. I'm not quite sure what the objective of the game is yet, but it certainly seems to be a little bit more advanced than the universe I generated. Good on you, Noobsy. Now, some of you may have seen this before, it's actually been quite popular on YouTube already. It's by Starfreak Clone, and it's written in the Pixel Game Engine, doing liquid simulations. And I'm just going to leave this one playing, because you can't help but enjoy watching it.
I do feel that the water is perhaps a little viscous. It's more of gloopy water than runny water. I like the word gloopy. I wonder if it is an effect of viscosity or an effect of the time step that the simulation is running at. Perhaps it's both, I don't know. Very nice Starfleet clone. Now I think this is Alter Ego's first go at a community showcase, and Alter Ego has been exploring geometry and how they can interact with each other, particularly with regard to collisions. It's great to spend time programming small things like this to gain an understanding of how they work and how you can use them in the bigger picture. So here Alter Ego is doing rectangle versus rectangle collision, but they're not necessarily axis aligned. That's a much trickier problem to solve. Now it wouldn't be a community showcase without an entry from Magetsu, but he'll be too busy playing a particularly recently released computer game. Now, he's into cyberpunk things such as Magenta and Cyan, and he created this uh, procedurally generated city. He probably won't even see this video, he'll be too absorbed in his new game. Now here we have a submission from Ericsson. I did a video this year about fractals. Well, it wasn't really about fractals, it was about how do we render fractals as fast as possible. And I actually went to Ericsson for advice on how to do the maths behind fractals. Ericsson is some sort of a maths genius. It's quite, well, unusual. And uh, he's developed a suite of tools where he can render fractals on his GPU. So here we can see him editing the shades. Now, whereas that would be enough for most of us, it's not enough for Ericsson. I really like that rotation feature. That's not as easy to do as you think. Ericsson likes to build tools on top of his simulation that allow him to, well, explore the fractals at different level of mathematical understandings. I have no idea what's going on here. I'll be quite honest. I could just make all sorts of stuff up, but I'm sure it's all well mathematically sound. Here we're looking at different properties within this fractal. I think it's a great demonstration that if you really know your subject matter, you can create some quite beautiful things. Now, we're all familiar with Mandelbrots, but that's not enough for Ericsson. We need to somehow deform the Mandelbrots into other fractals and do interesting spatial tricks with them. And this is all real time, by the way. It's a, a very powerful rendering system. I love the 3D effect that is achieved with the colorization. I understand a lot of this is done in the shaders on the GPU. And I'm going to finish this off with a good deep fractal zoom. Everybody likes those. So if you need to know anything about fractals, Ericsson is the guy to talk to. That and Kerbal Space Program. One of the wonderful things about programming and learning to code is you don't have to do games if it's not your thing. You can build tools and utilities too, like these guys. Trolled Woods has created his own programming language called Borkle. That's a great name. As you can see, he knows Ericsson, and we're going to do some fractals. How convenient. My understanding is that Borkle well, it compiles to C++ behind the scenes. But it's quite impressive for a homemade language to actually be as fast as this. I also really like the colour scheme he's using in his, uh, his command line there. Very nice. Hinin has created a graphical calculator. It allows you to enter what you want to display and then you can pan and zoom 
around in real time and explore and analyse the data. These sort of things make excellent starting projects. Because you really have to think about how you can only draw what you can see, and that means you've got to understand the maths as well as how to pan and zoom around the graph. Graphical calculators are quite a popular starting project, and so Jacob has also created one too. This one behaves very similar to the Desmos graphing calculator, a favourite in the One Lone Coder community. As you know, I'm a Windows user, and I'm always disappointed by the fact that Windows doesn't come with a built-in graphing calculator. It should do. Protobiter has created an epidemic simulation. So here we can see the parameters of the simulation before it runs. And here we can see it running the simulation. And of course this is quite relevant given what's happened this year. Once the simulation has run, you can analyse all sorts of data in real time. And then you can pull that data into spreadsheets and other office tools to analyse further. Now this attempts to be a realistic epidemic simulation. SourceWielder here has created quite an interesting tool. It's an AVR debugging tool. The AVR is simulated behind the scenes, but it's connected here to Visual Studio in a way which makes debugging familiar to those of us that use Visual Studio for debugging. So we can see stepping through code, we can see analysing variables, we can put in breakpoints, and we can see how the code actually runs on an AVR chip. This is not an easy thing to do. Here he has a blinking LED, so it's all emulated, so you can connect other bits of hardware to your simulation and see how they might respond in the real world. Ishidex 2 also likes doing low-level things. So here he's demonstrating, I believe it's his own language, running in his own operating system, which is written in Rust. There's a lot going on there. The utility is a general-purpose computer emulation virtual machine, but it is running a completely custom operating system. Operating system is good fun to have a go at. It's easy enough to get very basic things on the screen and then incredibly difficult to do absolutely anything else. Pandemic has created a tile editor. Now some of you may be familiar with this tile set, it's a very popular tile set, but a good tile editor should allow you to place whole objects like this on layers. You'll notice that quite a few people are using the same graphical user interface. Uh, this is actually called uh, Real Im GUI. It's an immediate mode GUI, and there is a Pixel Game Engine extension written by Dandestein that actually uses this GUI in the Pixel Game Engine. This is a different editor by Patrick Patrick. I quite like the graphics and the fact that they're not tile aligned. That's interesting. Now, this looks like your typical Raycaster. And we can see from this little pop-up map that it may well be a typical ray caster. But I understand that it is not casting individual rays per column of the screen, as we would normally do. Instead, it's using interesting geometry checks to draw the correct things to the screen, as he will now demonstrate. The map can be edited in real time. That's always a nice feature if you can actually edit the map whilst you're running around it. 
and we can see on this particular view which faces of the geometry are visible at any given time. Now so far it's all axis aligned geometry, but it doesn't have to be if you're working with geometry. That's a really nice effect being able to put circular shapes into the Raycast world. I might steal that. Because speaking of Raycast World, you may remember a few videos ago, I released a header for the Pixel Game Engine called Raycast World. And Dandestein here has really jumped on it and created a full level editing suite, which allows you to edit the different layers of the level, uh, the different wall sides, the ceilings and the floor. Uh, you can pop them into this orthographic projected view. And you can also paint the walls in real time as you're walking around the level. I think this is an editor we're going to see quite a bit of in the new year, when we return back to the MMO series, because the MMO game is going to be built using Raycast World. And it would be nice to have a level file format such as this created by Dandestein that we can all operate on. Now TPD has been working on this technology for some time. It uses the Pixel Game Engine and it renders these height maps in this very attractive looking 3D style. It's an entirely 2D hack, but quite a convincing one. You can add objects to the terrain and it has a built-in object placement tool. You can also add physics that respond to the terrain, so here we can see boulders rolling in the appropriate direction. And here we can see the rendering engine is actually quite a capable thing indeed, it can render a lot. And when you add sound effects to it, it very quickly becomes a game. It's a completely bonkers looking game, and the sound effects are quite strange. And there appears to be some hands sticking out of the terrain there. I like that. I like the fact that people can just let their imaginations run free. It doesn't matter, as long as you're having fun. Good stuff, TPD. This is a quick one. It's an OpenCL renderer written by Radox. This means it's not using typical rendering techniques and it'll be fully custom. Here we've got one that might look a bit fuzzy and blurry and I apologise if the YouTube algorithm hasn't compressed this very well. It's path tracing in real time as evidenced by being able to pick up this ball and knock it into the other. Path tracing is probably going to be the future of rendering. Uh, as you can see it looks a bit noisy at the moment and that's simply because we can't cast enough rays of light yet and make sure that they all hit the screen. And there are usual uh, tips and tricks you can do to try and reduce the number of, well, what look like sparkly pixels. You can spatio-temporal filter the screen afterwards and that sort of thing. But it allows you to have this real-time lighting, reflections and shadow, all basically for free. I think it looks fantastic at the moment. And as we get more powerful computers, we will start to see this become, well, I think, the default way of rendering things in the future. It's already made its way into tools such as Blender and Magic of Voxel. And this is for something of those of a certain age. Back in the 90s, there was something called Demo Scene, where you tried to do the most impressive things you possibly could with the least amount of code and resources. And basically everything looked like this, my binary bomb. Bright colours, scrolling imagery, and usually some chip tune playing in the background. This actually has some, but I've not included it because I don't want to get a strike. I wanted to try something a bit different for a showcase this year, and so I've included some projects which are generally a little bit more polished than usual. So a lot more time and development effort has gone into these, but I hope that they prove inspiring that you can actually achieve what look like good final finished games and products, but you just have to have the patience and determination to get there. First up we have this Battle Royale by Darks.
If it's your intention to just get straight into the game, using ready-made game tools such as Unity and Unreal and others is a great way to go. You don't have to worry about all of the minutiae of graphics engines and sound engines and physics engines. I know a lot of us enjoy those things, but they're not for everybody. Some people just want to make the games. Here we have another by Lone Dev. In this rather spooky and atmospheric demo, we're going to catch an enemy. There he is in the distance, quite a creepy looking thing. And we're going to try and trick it into catching us, but we're standing in a circle of salt, that known defender against all badness. Except heart attacks. Now this name may seem familiar to you. Solly is known for doing things in Excel, such as ray tracing and ray casting, and most likely the sequel to Cyberpunk 2077. But when he's not using Excel, he's been building this OpenGL graphics engine. It's got some quite advanced features. The lighting is quite accurate and atmospheric. The models are rendered swiftly, and shadows are cast, and normals are mapped, and things are bumped. It's all very pretty. It's quite a big leap to go from basic little experimental programs to full simulations and immersive worlds like this. Good on you, Solly. It looks really, really good. Keep it up. Here by MC Mike, we've got a strange little thing, but I really like the aesthetic, the fact that it all looks consistent with itself. I mentioned that before, but it really does make a difference. This one also has a bit of a message for the moment. It's about helping people with COVID-19 get to where they need to go. Nothing wrong with building tools that have an educational bias, and nothing wrong with building games for younger audiences either. Now, Justin Richard Musics has been working on this for quite some time. It's written in the Pixel Game Engine, and I just wanted to include this as an example of a finished product, really. You control a car, and the idea is to, well, win the race and destroy your opponents. But it's got lots of little attentions to details, such as the particle flurs, the tyre tracks left when the cars skid. The fact that the cars can go behind things on the scene. The car physics look like they could do with a little bit of improvement, but it's really hard to do car physics properly. Now this is quite a long entry, but it's also a very impressive one, so I thought we would all enjoy it in its full length. I've not cut it down. Starlinks has created Matter Flow, which is a universe, uh, and it's entirely procedurally generated. Starlinks has also spent a lot of time on making sure that it looks good, even though it's procedurally generated, and that's something that's actually quite difficult to do. If you're not in control of the thing that you're making, chances are it's going to look rubbish. But I must say, in this demonstration, nothing looks rubbish, it all looks rather spectacular. So everything you see here has been generated automatically. The shape of these space stations, how they're textured, what they're decaled with, all of the pipes and boxes and fittings, the other ships flying around, the stars in the background, the planets, absolutely everything. And the fact that you can go from outside like this into the crafts themselves like this as we go through this door is a really difficult thing to program. Here we can see some of the procedural generation in action. I think what I get from this video is that the procedural generation routine is actually quite a common one being applied to some basic templates. So though we saw the template being edited, and here we see it sort of automatically configuring itself to give you a unique looking thing. To me, and my naive eyes in such things, it looks a little bit like the wave collapse function being applied in 3D across the surface of the basic model. I could well be wrong though. But hey, maybe it makes me sound clever. Being able to generate assets like this automatically means you can generate many of them. And as a one-man band, Starlinks is doing an absolutely interstellar job. Haha. <laughs> Look at that heat effect on that shader. Really nice. Good attention to detail. Over the last few months, CPU has been remaking Maniac Mansion. It's in Unity. 
and there's a fantastic attention to detail. It also has an unusual guest character, as we can see on the screen. It is the full game, and if you hop on over to the Discord server, you can find links to start playing some of the uh, beta prototypes of it. I know that he's personally put a lot of effort into this. He's done all of the graphics, he's done all of the scripting engine, and he's modified it from the original game to include a few new things too. It's really worth checking out. And who doesn't love a reference to Forbidden C++? One of the best things about being a member of a large programming community such as the One Lone Coder Discord is you get to see those that are really putting the effort in into developing their own skill sets and helping out others and inspiring others with what they're creating. And by far and away this year, without a doubt, the person who just seems to be a complete production machine is Bisboo. Bispo has produced so much and posted so many videos this year on the server that I can't possibly include them all. So I'm going to look back at at least the last two months and you'll be surprised how much this guy can do in two months. It's actually quite depressing. Well, when you're a complete production machine like Bispo, it's difficult to know where to start. But let's start with this because it's pretty and it's got sounds and it's got sparkly effects. Bispo likes to experiment with all sorts of things, so here we know a well-known game with a well-known scene and a well-known character uh, being implemented by Bispo, and this is a great way to learn about how things are done. Try and emulate them. Pathfinding in a 2D scroller like this isn't as easy as it might seem. Bispo does a lot of things with the Pixel Game Engine, and here he's experimenting with a side-scrolling beat-em-up. One of the nice things to do is to get yourself a good asset pack because then that can encourage you to actually keep developing your application. If it looks good from the start, then you're more motivated to keep going with it. Don't bog yourself down by creating all of your own assets all the time. One of the things Bispo is great at is showing his progress. So quite a few videos every single day, and that means it's wonderful to follow along with the projects and see them develop. He also likes to include video snippets with debug overlays, which the rest of the community really enjoy. Bispo discovered Box2D this year as well, and here we can see it in its most basic form doing what it does. It does physics. and we can see a little character being wiggled about. And this probably put a spark in Bispo's imagination because he went on a bit of a journey. We can texture the character. Again, this is using decals in the Pixel Game Engine. And well, it looks humorous, but not very realistic. Moving on and perhaps using better graphics, and again using a physics engine in the background, He's implemented a very simple platform game. Now for many people, this would be enough. But not Bispo. Oh no. Bispo has gone on to implement his own 2D rendering framework that sits on top of Pixel Game Engine to handle the animation of characters. So here we can see a physics engine interacting with the background, deforming a model of the character. And it's always a good idea to be able to switch between a debug view and your actual view. It's far easier to debug these sort of things when you can actually see what's going on. As we can see in these early models, the character still looks a bit, well, a bit rigid. As usual, not satisfied, Bispo went on to develop some tools to help him create 3D looking distortion effects to 2D models. Now that's something obviously that's close to my heart. I like trying to do 3D graphics using 2D techniques. See, there we go, it is actually 2D, 
and sometimes it goes wrong. Adding this ability to deform sprites in this way can make them look very realistic with minimal animation requirements from the programmer. Using inverse kinematics to link together these different parts of your character and be able to deform the sprite around those bones can give you very realistic movements. And I'll probably be looking at some inverse kinematics next year. Here we can see the bones walking and where you can use bones where you don't expect them. The models end up being quite detailed. So these debug overlays I think are just as interesting as the underlying textured animation. Yes, thank you for that one, Bispoo. Finally, I just wanted to include this quick project, simply because I haven't seen anything like it before, and I think it's really technically innovative. TGD has created what I can only call a super emulator. It's an emulator of an old piece of hardware, in this case the BBC Micro. But it emulates the hardware in such a way that it can actually enhance the thing that it's emulating considerably and he's done this through the game Exile. This program by TGD requires quite a bit of explanation and I hope I can do it justice. What we've just seen is a game for the BBC Micro called Exile. What TGD has done has taken the original code from the game in its binary form and run it through the 6502 emulation I made for the NES and this is running in the Pixel Game Engine 2. But the original game didn't look quite like this it had a much narrower field of view. So TGD has modified his emulation of the BBC Micro to give us this wider field of view. This has required a few hacks and tricks running in the original game too, but it's a concept I've not seen or heard of before. This is, to all intents and purposes, the original game code, but the emulator has significantly enhanced it and allows us to see things that the original programmer never intended us to see, such as in this shot, the entire world almost all at once. There's no way the original hardware would have been able to do this, but this is the original code. I think this is a fantastically clever project, and I hope it gets a lot more recognition, particularly in the 6502 community. You can tell it's an absolute labor of love by TGD, I think that's absolutely brilliant. A really original idea. Well, I think this has been a really fantastic showcase. Some truly spectacular projects. And you can see the sheer amount of uh, passion and dedication from those people creating. It's really quite humbling. I know I've said it before, and I know it sounds cliche, but the One Lone Coder YouTube channel isn't really about me writing silly things in Visual Studio. It's about the community that's formed around it and how everybody is helping each other to become better programmers. Finally, I would like to thank all of those that have supported the channel this year, particularly via Patreon, YouTube channel subscriptions, Twitch subscriptions, and the occasional donations of games and other things too. I appreciate that the channel over the last few weeks particularly has not outputted as many videos as perhaps everybody here is used to. The good news from my perspective is that all of my really busy time at the moment with work is about to end, which means I can get back to making regular videos again. I know I've probably said this before, but next year I'd like to include more frequent community showcases. Let me know what your thoughts are about including perhaps a two minute showcase segment at the end of every regular video. This year the channel has gained another 100,000 subscribers. That's, that's really incredible and thank you so much. 
Now, what most of those subscribers probably don't know is that over the festive season I take a little break, and so it's my intention now to not put any more videos out on YouTube until probably February next year. Until then, however you celebrate your festive season, make sure you have a good one. Spend some time away from the computer. Go and spend it with friends and family if you can at the moment. I know it's not a great situation. And take care of yourselves, and I'll see you soon.